Ethical issues within social psychology. I advise that you know at least five ethical issues within psychological research and that you can identify examples of this and how this may arise within interviews and questionnaires. But importantly, you need to be able to suggest ways of dealing with these ethical issues when carrying out an interview or a questionnaire. In the UK, psychological research is monitored by the British Psychological Society, the BPS, and they produce the ethical guidelines that have been created that protect participants and have to be followed when conducting research. Now, the first one we're going to look at is consent. Any psychologist carrying out investigations should always obtain the valid consent of the participants, ensuring that they can make an informed decision about the nature of the contribution and its potential consequences. Now, ideally, you should be able to gain informed consent from participants. Now, this means that they absolutely know the true aim of the research, they've not been lied to, and they still volunteer to take part. Deception. Participants in no situation should be deliberately misled. Now, this includes with regards to what the study is about. Now, if we look at Milgram, he directly deceived his participants by telling them that they were doing research to do with punishment on learning when actually the study was about obedience. This is a clear example of deception where the participants were lied to about the aims of the experiment. In any sort of research, survey, questionnaire, anything like that, all participants should have the right to withdraw themselves and their data from the experiment at any time. And they should be told this by the researcher. Now, Milgram, another example, has been accused of not offering his participants the right to withdraw because the experimenter used prods, such as the experiment requires you to continue. And therefore, researchers and psychologists have argued that this meant that participants did not have the right to withdraw. At the end of any study, a participant should be debriefed, telling them the true aim and the extent of what went on within the study. This is the same for questionnaires and interviews. Uh, during this time, the researcher must make sure that participants leave in the same mind that they arrived in and they will not come to any psychological harm during the research. Now, Milgram is actually a fantastic example of this because not only did he debrief the participants and explain the true extent of the research, he also reintroduced the teacher to the learner so that they could see for themselves that the learner had come to no harm during the experiment. And Milgram argued that this was a way to make up for the distress and to make the participants feel better about themselves. Confidentiality. Now, this states that all participants have the right to keep any data about themselves kept confidential whenever they take part in any sort of research. Now, examples of this is Milgram had a partial confidentiality in the extent that he didn't publish or give out the names of any of his participants, but he did disclose the area that his participants were from, which actually made them quite easy to track down. Protection. Participants have the right and should be protected from harm, including psychological and physical harm, when taking part in any research at all. They should not be exposed to any more risk than they would have been exposed to in their normal day-to-day -day life. When we're talking about observations, it's quite important that we consider the privacy of the participants. Now, you cannot observe a participant without their direct consent in any environment that they wouldn't expect to be observed in. So, for example, it's okay to do an open observation in the middle of a town centre, uh, for example, because participants would expect to be observed in that situation. It isn't okay to go and sit outside somebody's house and watch them through their bedroom window. Now, again, we talked at the beginning about this idea of suggesting solutions and ways of dealing with ethical issues when conducting either an interview or a questionnaire. Now, the easiest ways to suggest this is to get the consent, particularly informed consent, if you can, from the participants. So telling them truthfully and honestly what the research is about um, and getting their consent to take part in that once they know what it's about. And this obviously avoids deception of the participants. You should be keeping all of their data confidential, but also giving them the right to withdraw themselves or their data at any point in the study if they want to do that. And you should still be debriefing them at the end and making sure that they knew the true extent of the, of the research and what it was about. Maybe give them some contact details if they've got any further questions for you uh, afterwards. OK, we're going to move on now to look at different sampling techniques. Now, a sample refers to the participants that you've used in your study and how you've gained those participants. Now, the first thing we should be doing is choosing a target population because the target population is the people that we want to be able to generalise our results to. So our sample, our participants that we're using, need to be a fair representative of that target population so that we can generalise. So, for example, if your target population is teenagers, then your sample should include teenagers and shouldn't be of young adults or um, anybody. With it without outside that age range. 
Now, the sampling techniques that you need to know about are random, stratified, opportunity and volunteer. And you need to know what they are, but also the strengths and weaknesses of them. So if we start with random sampling, random sampling occurs when every single member of that target population has an equal chance of being selected. Now the best way to explain this is everybody's name goes in a hat, everybody's got equal chance of their name being pulled out that hat, and therefore that's a good example of a random sample. Protection. Participants have the right and should be protected from harm, including psychological and physical harm, when taking part in any research at all. They should not be exposed to any more risk than they would have been exposed to in their normal day-to-day -day life. When we're talking about observations, it's quite important that we consider the privacy of the participants. Now, you cannot observe a participant without their direct consent in any environment that they wouldn't expect to be observed in. So, for example, it's okay to do an open observation in the middle of a town centre, uh, for example, because participants would expect to be observed. Stratified sampling is when you divide the target population into important subcategories and you then select the members of, of your um, participants based on this subcategory. You're making sure that all times the subcategories are in proportion with the target population. So for example, if the target population has got 75% women and 25% men, your sample should have 75% women and 25% men. So if your sample's 20 people, then you need to make sure that 15 of those people are women because that's 75% and 5 of them are men. Now, stratified sampling is really good because it is representative of the population, of the target population, so that allows us to be able to generalise. However, it can be very, very time-consuming and actually quite difficult to do. Opportunity sampling is probably the sampling technique that you're the most familiar with. And this is where we select subjects or participants to take part in our research that are around us and available at the time. So, for example, going into the, the sixth form common room and asking people if they're available and free to take part in your experiment. Now, this is really easy, really quick to do. It's like to be ethical. You've asked people if they're happy to take part and they've said, yeah. But this is not a very representative idea because you've only drawn from a small selection of the community. So, for example, if you have gone into the common room and asked people in the common room if they'll take part in your survey, you can only really generalise the results of that survey to people in your sixth form who were available at that time. Now, volunteer sampling is the idea where individuals have consciously or unconsciously determined their own involvement in that study. So, for example, they have volunteered, they've offered to do it. Now, you think about Milgram, that was a volunteer sample. He put an advert in a newspaper and people volunteered to take part in that study. Now, this is great because it gives you access to a variety of people you might not normally have had access to, and they're likely to be quite motivated to take part in your study. However, that motivation may make them behave differently. Volunteers may have something very special about them. You know, is there something different about somebody who volunteers to do something? And therefore, again, that poses these questions about whether you can then generalise the research. Now, Sampling techniques is a really important part of your exam and it often finds its way snuck into little questions like this where it's asking you to design a survey and carry out a survey but actually in here you have to include your sampling. So you have to choose a sampling technique that would work in this particular situation, justify why that sampling technique would work and why it would be better for this experiment. Now, I've put some examination questions and some extension questions on the board for you to have a little look at um, and to have a go at as part of a revision for this little bit of the module just to make sure that you understand it.